வணக்கம் இஃப் வி ஹேவ் லேர்ன்ட் அபவுட் த மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் மெட்டகாப்பல் நெக் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் வி சம்டைம்ஸ் டென் டு திங்க் தட் இட் இஸ் நாட் நெசசரி டு ரீட் செப்பரேட்லி அபவுட் மெட்டகாப்பல் ஷாஃப்ட் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் பட் வி நீட் டு ரிமெம்பர் தட் மெட்டகாப்பல் ஷாஃப்ட் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் ஹாவ் சர்டன் யூனிக் ஃபீச்சர்ஸ் லைக் ஃபார் இன்ஸ்டன்ஸ் யூ ஹவ் காட் ஸ்பைரல் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் ஆர் ஒப்ளிக் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் விச் நீட் வெரி ஸ்பெசிஃபிக் மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் அண்ட் it should be perfect because even 1 degree of rotational mal alignment cannot be tolerated for good function similarly the method of management of the metacarpal shaft fracture differs in terms of the methods of fixation so we need to learn about the management of finger metacarpal shaft fractures in a very specialized way that we shall be doing in this video finger metacarpal shaft fractures can basically be divided according to their orientation into three basic types transverse fractures oblique fractures which could be transversely oblique or vertically oblique spiral fractures as seen in the second metacarpal bone in this sample x-ray and comminuted fractures which is seen in the third metacarpal bone in this example transverse metacarpal shaft fractures are usually produced by axial loading forces and the fractures angulate with the apex dorsal and the interosseous muscles which pull on the volar side are the deforming force which cause the angulation the evaluation of this angulation can be done both clinically and more accurately on x-ray oblique and spiral fractures are usually the result of torsional forces which cause rotational mal alignment and this mal rotation is poorly tolerated it is difficult to assess on plain x rays it can be judged clinically by asking the patient to flex all the fingers simultaneously and if there is mal rotation there will be scissoring of the fingers or crossing of one finger over the other if this occurs open reduction should be considered comminuted fractures of the metacarpal shaft on the other hand are usually produced by direct impact they are associated with more soft tissue injury and may produce more shortening the treatment of metacarpal shaft fractures can basically be divided into closed reduction methods open reduction methods and external fixation the closed reduction methods can be followed up with pop immobilization percutaneous pinning or intramedullary fixation immobilization with either pop or thermoplastic material following closed reduction is the commonest method that is used since it is applicable for most metacarpal shaft fractures especially fractures of the third and fourth metacarpals as they are supported on either side by the intact second and fifth metacarpals as a matter of fact burkhalter went so far as to advocate close treatment for fractures if there was no rotational mal alignment on clinical examination the method of close reduction for such fractures would consist of palmarly directed load or force applied to the dorsal apex at the fracture site with a dorsally directed force to the flexed metacarpophalangeal joint the immobilization is done with a well molded pop slab using minimal padding at the same time we need to ensure that there is satisfactory rotational alignment by looking at the nail complex alignment as you can see here in the example below there is a rotation deformity of the nail complex in the picture below and the tips of the fingers can also be examined for alignment to rule out any rotation of the metacarpal following reduction this immobilization will consist of a short arm cast with the wrist in 30 to 40 degrees of extension metacarpophalangeal joints flexed to 80 to 90 degrees and interphalangeal joints kept extended this is sometimes known as a clam digger splint after 3 weeks of immobilization in this position mobilization is begun 
after providing a wrist stabilization splint and compression with a crepe bandage. This method of closed reduction and POP mobilization should not be used if there is a spiral or oblique fracture, if there is a transverse fracture with no stability after reduction or if there is less area of bone to bone contact after reduction. An alternative method after closed reduction is percutaneous pinning. It could be transverse pinning by application of transverse K-wires to fix the metacarpal shaft fracture through the adjacent intact metacarpal. It needs two wires distally and one wire proximal to the fracture. A study said that this method of percutaneous pinning for metacarpal shaft fractures offered a bending stiffness approaching that of plate and screw fixation. This technique can be used when the fracture can be reduced but cannot be maintained in a POP splint or when concomitant soft tissue injury requires dressing changes and inspection. Fluoroscopy is invaluable in carrying out this procedure. Percutaneous intramedullary fixation of the fracture can also be used for unstable metacarpal fractures with the use of image intensification. First, a cortical window is made at the base of the involved metacarpal bone. Then, three or four pre-bent wires of 0.9 mm diameter are inserted and buried within the medullary canal. A detailed description of this technique is available in the video shown in the icon above. By the same technique, intramedullary headless compression screws can also be used. So far, we have seen three methods of immobilization following closed reduction of metacarpal shaft fractures. But sometimes, closed reduction may not be ideal, in which case we will have to do open reduction. The indications for open reduction are the following. Open fractures, especially if associated with bone loss, contamination or soft tissue injury are prime indications for open reduction. If there are multiple metacarpal fractures, open reduction is indicated since the stabilizing effect of adjacent metacarpals is lost and closed reduction will not be effective. It is easier to manage the wound, the associated soft tissue injuries and the metacarpal shaft fractures by open reduction. If an attempt has been made to do a closed reduction of a metacarpal shaft fracture but it proves irreducible, it is an indication for open reduction. Similarly, unstable fractures that is fractures of the border metacarpals or marginal metacarpals are indications for open reduction. Even the slightest amount of rotational malalignment is an indication for open reduction, especially in transverse fractures, spiral and oblique fractures. Apparent shortening of the finger due to the metacarpal shaft fracture can be accepted up to 5 mm. Beyond that, it is an indication for open reduction. Dorsal angulation is a fairly constant finding in metacarpal shaft fractures. Though about 30 to 40 degrees of angulation can be accepted in the 4th and 5th metacarpal shaft fractures, only 10 to 20 degrees of angulation can be accepted in the 2nd and 3rd metacarpal shaft fractures. But even in these acceptable levels, there are some effects that may warrant open reduction. Sometimes the metacarpal head may be prominent in the palm, causing pain on grasp. Because of the angulation, there may be a compensatory hyperextension at the metacarpophalangeal joint and a secondary pseudoclaw deformity with digital extension may be present. And if the metacarpal shortening due to the angulation is great enough, the intrinsic muscles may be unable to accommodate, so they are weakened. Finally, the dorsal prominence may be aesthetically displeasing as it may cause a hump on the dorsum of the hand. The method of open reduction would entail the following points. To access the fracture, a longitudinal incision is made on the dorsum of the hand on one side of the extensor tendon overlying the involved metacarpal. If all four metacarpals require reduction, two longitudinal incisions are used, one between the fourth and fifth metacarpals and one between the second and third metacarpals. 
After making the incision, while approaching the fracture, care must be taken to preserve the cutaneous nerves and the paratenon surrounding the extensor tendons. There may be a need to divide one of the juncture tendinum for fracture visualization and this should be repaired after the fixation is over. The fracture ends are then exposed and the fracture hematoma is removed. Reduction can be achieved by longitudinal traction. The next step is by what technique to fix this reduced fracture. There are different techniques available for fixation after open reduction. K-wire fixation, composite or tension band wiring, circlage wiring and interosseous wiring, interfragmentary screw fixation and finally plate and screw fixation. About deciding which of these techniques is to be used, a study in 2001 stated that rigid fixation is usually unnecessary. However, fixation must be sufficiently stable to maintain reduction and allow early rehabilitation. And the choice of implant is dictated by the fracture configuration, clinical situation and the experience of the surgeon. Before we go forward from here, we need to know one important thing. The complication of non-operative management of metacarpal shaft fractures is deformity. Whereas the complications of inappropriate or improperly done operative management are deformity and stiffness. The commonest method of fixation after open reduction is with the use of K-wires. The K-wires can be used in different configurations, single, multiple or crossed with different orientations, transverse or longitudinal, with versatile usage. They can be used as standalone fixation, they can supplement other methods of fixation and they can also substitute if other methods of fixation if they fail. There are some disadvantages in using K-wires for fixation. They are not rigid, they may loosen or migrate and they may distract the fracture fragments if not inserted properly. Pin tract infections may develop and pin protrusion may hamper therapy. Apart from the routine technique of K-wire fixation of metacarpal shaft fractures, there are some important points that we need to remember. Multiple passes with the wires should be avoided. This results in lot of heat injury and also may cause loosening of the wires after fixation. So I advise what is known as one pass fixation. That is, you reduce the fractures, hold them and fix it with a single pass of the K-wire. It may not be perfect, but it will allow good healing of the bone. With longitudinal K-wire fixation alone, there would still be a rotatory instability. Hence, this fixation should be supported with a POP slab. The K-wire should not project into the joint, especially the metacarpophalangeal joint as this may lead to problems during mobilization. In this example, the K-wires have done a satisfactory reduction and fixation, but they project into the metacarpophalangeal joints and this may compromise the results. One end of the wire would be under the skin. We prefer to cut it short and bury it under the skin to reduce the chances of pin tract infections developing. Of course, this would entail another short procedure to remove the wire. We always need to use a splint support while starting therapy and it is not advisable to be in a hurry to remove the K-wires at 3 weeks unless the wrist joint is immobilized. The K-wires can be left on as long as possible for up to even 4 weeks till the patient understands the importance of therapy and splint support. In this illustrative example, the K-wires were removed at exactly 3 weeks and patient asked to mobilize. Patient presented after another 2 weeks with recurrent angulation of the metacarpal shaft. K-wire fixation is indicated ideally for isolated short oblique and transverse fractures of the metacarpal shaft. If possible, it should be supplemented with composite wiring to increase the rigidity of the fixation. The next method of fixation is composite fixation otherwise known as tension band wiring. This method is a combination which uses K-wires and monofilament stainless steel wire. 
The stainless steel wire is inserted as a tension band through a small transverse drill hole in the distal fragment crossed around the K wires at the bone interface proximally. The advantages of this technique of tension band wiring are that it provides additional stability, fracture compression, superior strength, stiffness and bony approximation and most importantly the fixation that it provides is stable enough to permit early motion. The contraindications for the use of this technique are bone loss, comminution of the fracture and osteopenia. The next fixation techniques are the cerclage and interosseous wiring. Cerclage wiring was described in 1984. 24 gauge stainless steel wiring were used for oblique and spiral metacarpal shaft fractures. According to this method, drill holes are passed in a single cortex both proximal and distal to the fracture and interosseous wire is used and then a stainless steel wire is used to go around the entire circumference of the bone to hold it in place. The interosseous wiring technique on the other hand uses stainless steel wire to go between the fracture ends which may be used along with a single K wire to augment the stability of the construct. The two interosseous wires may be in a 90-90 configuration or two parallel constructs. A study stated that for metacarpal shaft fractures, interosseous wiring even without K wire fixation is rigid enough for immediate post-operative finger mobilization. The role of K wire would be required only if there was comminution or bone loss. Interfragmentary compression screws also form an important part of the armamentarium of fixation of metacarpal shaft fractures. They provide stable fixation and they are primarily indicated for long oblique and spiral shaft fractures. Here the fracture length must be a minimum of at least twice the diameter of the bone. The advantage of this method of fixation is that it allows early active range of motion. But the disadvantage is that we need special equipment and the procedure is technically demanding. We need to follow certain principles when the screws are being applied. The longitudinal compressive or axial forces are best counteracted by placing the screws 90 degrees to the bone's long axis. At the same time, torsional forces are best resisted by placing the screw 90 degrees relative to the plane of the fracture. As a biomedia, to resist both axial and torsion loading, the screw should be placed in a plane bisecting the fracture plane and the longitudinal axis of the bone. In large built adults, we need a minimum of two 2.7 mm screws. In smaller built individuals, we need minimum of three 2.4 mm or 2 mm screws. And the placement of the screw hole is also important. To avoid fragmentation, the screw hole should be a minimum of two screw diameters from the fracture margin. The procedure of interfragmentary screw fixation of a metacarpal fracture involves six sequential steps. Step 1 Bicortical drilling with a 2 mm drill bit, that is, the internal diameter of the screw. Step 2 Countersinking to make the screw as low profile as possible. Step 3 measurement of the depth. Step 4, tapping with the 2.7 mm tap, that is the outside diameter of the screw. This is not needed if the screw is self tapping. Step 5, creation of a gliding hole by over drilling the near cortex with a 2.7 mm drill bit. Step 6, insertion of the screw. The screw must engage the far cortex to lag and compress the fracture. The final method of fixation of the fracture is rigid fixation with plates and screws. Generally, plate and screw fixation is indicated for complex situations such as open fractures, multiple metacarpal shaft fractures or when there is a combination of diaphyseal bony loss or comminution associated with significant soft tissue injury. It has the obvious advantages of providing rigid fixation and maintaining the length especially when there has been a comminution or bone loss. The disadvantages of using plate fixation are that the technique is demanding, there is a very narrow margin for error, 
it requires considerable soft tissue mobilization and elevation of the periosteum which may devascularize the bone fragments. The plates are bulky and may interfere with tendon movements. The plates may also be palpable under the thin dorsal skin. Technique wise, at least 2 mm or 2.4 mm plates are used. Screw fixation of at least 4 cortices, both proximal and distal to the fracture. That means a minimum of 2 screws both proximally and distally. There may be a need for supplemental fixation with an interfragmentary screw especially for transverse and short oblique fractures. This screw can be placed either through a hole in the plate or obliquely across the fracture to enhance fracture stability. In case of osteopenic bone or for reconstruction of non-unions or malunions, 2.7 mm locking plates are indicated. Here, extensive stripping of the periosteum is not required. As far as possible, after the fixation, the periosteum should be approximated over the plate with absorbable suture. A below elbow splint with bulky dressing should be applied for a minimum of one week. Edema and intrinsic muscle injury are expected. Active range of motion can be initiated with wrist support. A study revealed that complications after plate and screw fixation for metacarpal shaft fractures were seen in 35% of the patients. Difficulty with fracture healing was seen in 15%, stiffness in 10%, plate loosening or breakage in 8% and complex regional pain syndrome and infection were the other complications that were seen. The incidence of complications were noted to be higher if there was associated bone loss, soft tissue injury, open fractures and transverse shaft fractures. We need to note that after all these methods of fixation of metacarpal fractures after open reduction, implants are involved and may have to be removed either routinely or due to a problem. K wires may be removed 3 to 6 weeks after fixation. The AOASIF group recommends screw and plate removal approximately 6 months after fixation. But this is not routinely done. The plate can be removed if it is perceived as bulky or irritating. If there are restrictive additions and tenolysis or capsulotomy procedure is indicated. And the removal can be done with the warning that refracture may occur after the removal of the plate. We have now seen the different methods of fixation of metacarpal shaft fractures after open reduction. Composite wiring, circlage and intraosseous wiring, K-wire fixation, interfragmentary compression screws and plate and screw fixation. The final method of management of metacarpal shaft fractures is external fixation. There is a role for the use of external fixation in metacarpal shaft fractures. They can be used for severe fractures when anatomic reconstitution of the skeleton is not feasible, for highly comminuted open shaft fractures with or without bone loss, for comminuted intra-articular fractures and for fractures with injury or loss of soft tissue structures. The advantages of using external fixation can be summed up in a single line. There is respect for bone biology. Further devascularization does not occur of the fracture fragments since they are not stripped of the periosteal blood supply. Adequate stability is given to permit early mobilization. If there is concomitant soft tissue injury, external fixation permits ready access to the wound for either debridement and reconstruction if necessary. The complications that can occur due to the use of external fixation are pin track infection, osteomyelitis, fracture through the pinholes after removal of the fixator, neurovascular injury during insertion of the fixator pins, over distraction leading to subsequent non-union, impairment of tendon gliding and motion, interference with the adjacent digits by the fixator pins. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about the basics of metacarpal neck fracture management and the basics of metacarpal head fracture management. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery. 
ட்ராமா சர்ஜரி அண்ட் எத்திக்ஸ் வணக்கம்